So I chose this um, theme of the symbol that I will present through different disciplines, uh, art, aesthetics, philosophy, anthropology, and critical theory in general. And I hope uh, that uh, it will be interesting for you. So just to, to remind you of the general organization of this class. So this morning I will do, um, give a general introduction to, to the problem uh, from symbol to the symbolic. Then tomorrow we'll turn to Claude Levashro's Structural Anthropology and the introduction to the work of Marcel Mauss. I hope you, you, you all got the uh, PDFs. Um, then um, on Wednesday, we'll turn to Lacan, and the last day, um, I assign the Roland Barthes text, but I will perhaps add something else, like perhaps a bit of Judith Butler, but I will give you a handout. Uh, I'm still not entirely sure of this last day. So, um, this is the general organization. Uh, I don't know how I will share the time between lecturing and discussion, We'll find out together. But in any case, if you need to interrupt me for, for anything, any question you may have in the course of my presentation, please do. Don't hesitate to do that. I don't know if I will reserve some time in the end or just in the middle. We'll see how it goes. Okay? All right. So, um, what is a symbol? Introduction. So, uh, what I intend to do here is to present and analyze three major breaks in the history of the term symbol. <coughs> three major breaks that have uh, affected its meaning, the meaning of the term, and um, have had a dramatic influence on our ways of thinking in, as I said, uh, critical theory, art, aesthetics, philosophy, etc. So let me uh, briefly present the three breaks and we will examine this morning the two first ones. First, the break between a rhetorical meaning of the term symbol and an aesthetic one. The term symbol, which I will define in a moment, used to make sense in rhetoric since uh, the Greeks. Aristotle was the first thinker to assign a rhetorical meaning to the term. So it used to make sense in rhetoric, that is the art of discourse. In fact, the symbol was a figure, a trope, figure of discourse. And at the turn of the 18th century, uh, there was a displacement that took this term, that displaced this term from, this, uh, from the rhetoric to the aesthetic field. So the symbol became a major figure in fine arts and in the way uh, of talking about art. So it was, uh, we'll see that this morning, that Hegel, uh, the German philosopher, is the one who really analyzed as close as possible this passage, and he analyzes it as the passage from classical to what he calls the romantic art. And that's something that emerges in the 18th century. So this is the first major break, the passage from uh, the discourse to uh, the aesthetics. The second break, Perhaps I will have time to introduce it this morning, but we'll do, essentially, we'll do it essentially tomorrow. Appears at the turn, the turn of the 19th century and first half of the 20th century with modern anthropology and ethnology. So this is precisely the work of Claude Lévi-Strauss, you know, the French anthropologist, after Marcel Mauss, who's also an important um, ethnographer. So the break in anthropology and psychoanalysis with Jacques, with Jacques Lacan. So this time, the passage is from the term symbol or symbolism to the substantive, the symbolic. So we have uh, the second passage, uh, right that on the board. So first we have the passage from rhetoric to aesthetics. And the second one is the passage from symbol or symbolism to what Lacan will call the symbolic. And Levi Strauss will talk about the symbolic function, but you've all heard of this term, the symbolic. So I will try to analyze what that means. 
the third break appears in the second half of the 20th century with precisely the critique of the symbolic. Hmm? Uh, so critique of the symbolic by thinkers like Derrida, Foucault, Judith Butler. So that's why I'm still uh, thinking of what kind of text I will give you on Thursday. Critique of the symbolic as being too normative a category. We'll see why. So, for example, I think I will give you the, the Butler's passage in uh, Gender Trouble, where, where she uh, explicitly attacks this notion of the symbolic in Levi Strauss, showing that it is uh, normative and still heteronormative. So, we have uh, three main, uh, it is also a critique of psychoanalysis, as you can find it in Michel Foucault. Uh, okay, so th these are the three major breaks that I want to analyze with you and perhaps introduce, in conclusion, a fourth one that I'm trying to uh, analyze myself. I'm wondering if we're not facing today a kind of new economy or refashioning of the term symbolic that would include biology and in particular neurobiology. Okay? So that, 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 would, that would go beyond uh, the critique that is the third moment. So my conclusion will be an open one. Like, are we, uh, are we uh, facing today a kind of new crisis, a new definition of the symbol? But this will be an open question. Okay, so this is the general frame, and you have each time the PDFs that we need, like Levi Strauss, Lacan, uh, and Bach, essentially. Okay, so let's move to the first one, from rhetoric to aesthetics. And let's start with the classical, common, usual definition of the term symbol. So a symbol, according to, um, it's not on the handout, it's independent. A symbol, according to its uh, most common definition, is something that speaks for something else. So the notion of displacement is essential uh, to the definition of the symbol. So for example, if you look in the dictionary, you'll find something which stands for something else, like for example, the scale for justice. And this meaning of uh, transference, we'll see that transference is essential to the notion, was, recording, was recorded in like around the 16th century and what is important is that this transference, like something which stands for something else, happens in the absence of that thing. Okay? So, for example, you have the scale for justice when justice is not present. You know? So it's something that stands for something else in the absence of that thing. The, the word symbol derives from the Greek symbolon. So the symbol, and this is important for us, because we'll see that uh, Levi-Strauss plays a lot with that meaning. So symbol means, it's a contradictory meaning. Sim means together. It's like the same radical that it synthesis, so together. But ballet, on the other hand, means to break or to throw away. So it means that a symbol is one thing made out of two. It's, it's a kind of articulated unity, in both a unity and a difference. So what was it initially? It was a piece of clay that two contractants broke, and each of them kept a piece of it, a, a half of it. And it was a proof of, a, of alliance. When, when there was an oath or a contract, the Greeks used to break that piece of clay in two or in several parts, and each member kept a part. It was a proof of alliance, and we'll see that it's very important for anthropology. And when the two parts were brought together, the contract was recognized or accomplished. And the well, the contractants could even transmit the broken part to their descendants uh, up until the contract was finally 
realized. So you have these two dimensions of unity and rupture. And of course, in the piece of clay, the two parts fit perfectly well together. So, in fact, in this little piece of clay, we find, uh, we understand why we could derive from that the meaning of something that stands for something else. First, because the piece of clay was standing for the contract, okay, so it was a symbol in that sense, a symbol of the contract. But also, because as I said, a symbol represents the things in its absence, so we also have in the symbol the, um, the play with the absence, like we break and we, we all have a piece of it. So we have, in a certain sense, a presence and an absence in hand. Okay? So already the, the symbol was symbolic in that sense, because uh, it was... Uh, a kind of presence in the absence. So, we have already the two meanings in this piece of clay, like the object in place of something else, but also a convention that binds the contractants together. Right? So, this is important to remember, that the symbol, at the same time, cuts the presence of the thing, because it represents it in its absence, mm -hmm. and at the same time, it is binding. It's a, it's a convention that binds the pieces together. Okay. So we have this contradictory meaning of absence and at the same time binding uh, an alliance. So this was the general definition, and we'll see that we'll find it again and again in our analysis. So if we move now to the rhetorical sense of the term. And there's a very interesting book that um, I think appears, yes, on your handout is the quote number five. It's the book by Todorov, Theories of the Symbol. You know, Todorov disappeared recently. I don't know if you've seen that in the newspaper. He was a great um, a theorist of aesthetics and linguistics, etc. And he has this book, which is very interesting, which is called Theories of the Symbol, in which he retraces the whole history of the term. So I will follow here his uh, analysis of uh, the rhetorical meaning. So, of course, in, in rhetoric, we will find that is the art of discourse. As I said, it started in Greece and up to the turn of the 18th, 18th century. We find, again, this absence-presence thing. So a symbol is generally, in rhetoric, a figure of discourse. And it includes allegories, metonymies, metaphors. It's, a, it's an umbrella term in rhetoric. It's not only a symbol, like the scale for justice. It's um, a term that designates all kinds of um, uh, tropes that is, uh, figures of rhetoric, in which you have a signified, okay, whatever it is, for example, justice, okay, and two possible, well, you have a direct signifier, okay, for example, justice, this is the concept, the signifier is justice, the term, the phonetic term, but the symbol is what will displace this into another one, like the scale. Okay? So we have two uh, ways of designating justice, which is justice and the scale. All right? So in the act of symbolization, we start with the same signified, but we displace the signifier. All right? So we find the same play that we had in the beginning, like the broken unity. Uh, because the three terms are at the same time together and <coughs> displaced. <coughs> so as I said, uh, it includes allegories, metaphors, etc. And of course we find that kind of tropes in all uh, possible uh, literary examples. Okay? I, I, I just found one that I, I love in uh, Wuthering Heights where Emily Bronte says, my love for Linton is like the foliage in the woods. 
Time will change it. I'm well aware as winter changes the trees. My love for Heathcliff resembles the eternal rocks beneath a source of little visible delight, but necessary. So you see the symbol in what for love is the foliage in the woods in one case and the eternal rocks in the second. So I won't um, add to that list. You all know what a symbol or a trope in literature is. So this is uh, the first kind of uh, what this is the first moment of the definition when we can with language play with displacements and both express something like a, a me the meaning of a thing in another way like using a second signified to 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 make the meaning explicit but this is also a way that we use to, to make us feel that we all belong to the same community, like linguistic community. Like to know how to speak a language is not only to understand the meaning of things, of words, but also to be able to displace these meanings. And uh, the more talented you, you get into mastering a language, the more able you are to displace it. So you, you, you find the, this double dimension of uh, representing something in its absence and at the same time belonging to the same community, like having this contract with, with, which is uh, the linguistic contract, like we understand each other, which means not only, as I said, that we, we understand the meaning of things, but that we're also able to play uh, with um, replacements, substitutions, displacements, etc. So, how is it possible to displace meaning? How is it possible to speak in the absence of the thing without um, dismantling language itself? How is it possible? What are the limits of these displacements? So this brings me to, um, uh, to add something to the definition of the symbol, which is that there is an essential difference between a symbol and a sign. So this difference you'll find uh, I'm lost in my in my handout because I, I don't have the same uh, as you. So yeah, you find it in Hegel and in Saussure. So the difference yes, sorry. Just to confirm the, what, what I was just saying, that was the first quote. I call symbol, it's from Ricoeur, all structures of significance where a direct, primary, literal sense designates another indirect, secondary, figured sense that can only be learned through the first. So it was about displacement. And now I'm coming to the two following quotes, which is that there's a difference between a symbol and a sign. A sign, a linguistic sign, is entirely arbitrary. Like, for example, the link between Justice, between the concept of justice and the word justice, the sound, is perfectly arbitrary. There's no reason why we can explain why this is called a table, right? So this is the motive of the arbitrariness of the sign that we'll find in Saussure uh, and in Hegel. I will read the quotes in a moment. Rather than in a symbol, the link between the signified and the signifier is said to be necessary. That is, that justice. We understand why justice is symbolized as a scale. Okay? We understand that scale means uh, equality, ju justice, etc. Rather, we don't understand why justice is called justice, like uh, the phonic uh, word. Okay? So it's the displacement, the symbolic displacement, it uh, keeps the order of language, does not displace language, it's displacement within language, but doesn't displace language itself, because the link between the signifier and the signifier in a symbol is necessary. Okay? So it, it keeps a certain cohesion, coherence within language. So this is what we find in the two following quotes on my handout. Hegel in Aesthetics says, Therefore, it is a different thing when a sign is to be a symbol. The lion, for example, is taken as a symbol of magnanimity, the fox of cunning, the circle 
of eternity, the triangle of trinity. Okay, so Hegel explains here that all symbols are necessary. We understand why the lion symbolizes force, uh, etc., etc. And Saussure, in the course in general linguistics, like 100 years later, the word symbol has been used to designate the linguistic sign, or more specifically, what is here called the signifier. One characteristic of the symbol is, and this is what is important, is that it is never wholly arbitrary. It is not empty. For there is the rudiment of a natural bond between the signifier and the signified. The symbol of justice, a pair of scales, could not be replaced by just any other symbol, just such as a, sh a chariot. Okay? So you find here again the idea that the link between the two parts of the sign, that is the signified and the signifier, is necessary and almost, uh, uh, Saussure says, natural. And we'll see that this naturality of the sign, of the symbol, is precisely what will be criticized in our third break. Because to say that something is natural is already a kind of normative assumption, but we'll see that later on. And of course, from the, ret the rhetorical hues of the symbol, we can move to hermeneutics. Like, uh, in order to analyze a discourse, for example, a poetic discourse, but also a, rigid, a religious discourse, like in the Bible, which is full of symbols, we need a specific science that will decipher all the images, all the displacements, and this science is hermeneutics. So, I, I put on the handout the definition of hermeneutics, which is the work of thought that consists on deciphering the hidden sense in the apparent sense, in developing the significance and levels implied in the literal significance. Okay? Because it's not because the link is natural between the signifier and the signified that the understanding of the symbol is easy. Sometimes, even if the link is not arbitrary, you need hermeneutics in order to really understand what is meant by the symbolic displacement. So, as I said, for a long time, that is for really several centuries, the symbolic was entirely, was entirely defined as a linguistic phenomenon. The art, as I said, of using figures, and also an art of hiding what you wanted to say. In order to, when you don't want to, to, to say something uh, directly, and Foucault has worked a lot on that, how to tell the truth to someone. You can tell it directly, or you can use symbols as well. So, it is also a way of, um, well, it's both poetic, but it is also a kind of uh, ruse. Well, for example, think of the dialogue between Plato and the Sophists, like a way of uh, talking without talking, a way of telling things without telling them. So the symbol has a very rich uh, rhetoric rhetorical history that, yeah, that you can find in, in uh, Todorov's book. Second break, or well, first break, I mean, sorry, <laughs> when we move from the uh, linguistic to the grammar, it's my second moment, this is what I wanted to say. So what happens uh, with Romanticism, and in particular German Romanticism? that is, the turn of the 18th century, when the word symbol will um, designate something, of course, still linked with, with the past significance, but still entirely different. To affirm that there's a kind of natural bond between uh, the signified and the signifier means that, in a certain sense, a symbol 
uh, and this is the difference with the sign, is a kind of imitation of the signified. That language, and this was uh, this is Aristotle's theory of uh, mimesis, that if language tolerates these displacements, like the scale for justice, the force, the line for force, etc., it's because language uh, allows for its own duplication, <coughs> imitation. Romanticism appears as a theory of art that totally breaks with the idea of imitation. This is the first crisis of mimesis, which is that no, there is nothing like a pure imitation, whether in art in general, so you have these texts on painting by all German romantis, uh, romantics, like painting is no imitation, but also in language. When we speak, we don't imitate anything. So when we use when we make use of images, these images are not imitations. So Romanticism develops, and Todorov shows it very interestingly, uh, Romanticism develops a new theory of expression, and expression means both linguistic and artistic, that puts an end to the idea that art or language are imitations. Which means that each symbol, each work of art, has an end in itself, does not refer to something, you know this idea that the, the thing means, well, the symbol means in the absence of the thing, it's not true. The symbol, of course, is a displacement, but it is autonomous, Does, it ceases to refer to something external. So it's the idea, which is very important in hermeneutics, because it opens a new era to hermeneutics and interpretation, that in order to interpret something, you have to remain within the thing, without referring to something external. So it's the idea of an autonomy of meaning, which means that each work of art, but even the image, even if you have the feeling that the image is an imitation, we have to find the meaning of that image within itself. It's a closed totality. Which means that art and discourse cease to be subordinated to the external reality. So the beautiful as well as the linguistic, have an autonomous existence. And so Todorov says, it, it is the, the following quote, all the characteristics of a work of art are concentrated in a single notion, which the romantics will later call symbol. So here, symbol will cease to mean something that refers to something else, but something that exists in itself. And you find this notion in German romantics such as essentially Moritz, Schlegel, Goethe, Humboldt, Schelling. Which means that a symbol to say it differently, is intransitive. It doesn't open to something else. It has a closed totality that contains its meaning in itself. So it ceases to refer to any transcendent presence. And so this is um, strange enough because the usual vision we have of Romanticism is precisely a kind of mysticism, like the symbols refer to a transcendent presence. On the contrary, the symbol is intransitive, and for that reason, because it only, and this is the paradox, because it only refers to itself, its meaning is inexhaustible. 
Right? His meaning is infinite. This is the paradox of romanticism. Like, the thing is closed on itself, but because it's closed on itself, paradoxically, it's infinitely open. Its expressions, the symbolic expressions, are loaded with the deepest and most inexhaustible meaning. So, for example, if I refer to French poetry, Mallarmé is said to be a symbolist. Uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, this hermetism that, that is often. Uh, said about Mallarmé, that is that it's, the poetry is entirely made of symbols, but at the same time, these symbols don't open to anything else than themselves. So, it, um, it, instead of having an economy of meaning, which is a reference to something external, you have an economy of meaning that is uh, uh, referred to the, um, uh, to the openness of the closure in a certain sense. <coughs> the way in which something that is totally closed on itself and ceases to refer to something external at the same time is infinitely open. So this is also uh, what um, uh, the German uh, romantic uh, Moritz calls a totegory. He, he coins that a symbol is a totegory. He coins that um, concept in order to designate what a symbol is, which totegory, so it's not category, it means a totality um, that says everything and at the same time does not refer to anything external. So of course we can also refer to symbolic painting uh, you know, at, at this moment of the well, yeah, beginning of the 19th century. So it means that um, it is very important in aesthetics and even in rhetoric that language and art, because uh, German Romanticism is an inquiry in both domains, language and art have uh, no external purposiveness. But we don't speak to communicate and we don't create in order to say something. Okay? But what we produce with language or with art is that kind of uh, well, that series of uh, figures um, that are closed on themselves and express an infinite, uh, well, an infinity of meanings. The, the, the major uh, thinker of this passage from the rhetoric to the um, aesthetic meaning of the symbol is Hegel. And that's why um, in my handout I have these quotes by Hegel, so I'll tell you a little bit about Hegel. <coughs> so something very strange in Hegel aesthetics is that Hegel distinguishes between three great moments in the history of art. Symbolic art. And symbolic art is essentially, for him, Egyptian art. Classical art, which is Greek. And romantic art, which is his time. And German romanticism up to now, up to the moment when Hegel is writing. So it is very striking to see that what that the symbolic moment is precisely not the romantic one. That the moment when symbol becomes an aesthetic notion, bizarrely Hegel doesn't. I mean, he plays with that in a way that I will explain. But he doesn't. He should have called the, the romantic period the symbolic one, but he doesn't. On the contrary, he assigns this notion of the symbolic to the most imitative, mimetic form of art, okay? which is, according to him, the Egyptian art. So what does Hegel 
what what he, what is he exactly doing in his aesthetics? And this is you'll see that it is important for us for, for the rest of the development. He shows how the symbol is a deconstructive notion before well before of course the invention of the term uh, deconstruction. This is what Hegel does. He deconstructs really the notion of the symbol because he will show. He will play with the double meaning of the term, that is, the broken unity and the absence, etc., showing that this meaning applies to the history of the symbol itself, that the symbol has become a displaced notion from its first uh, meaning of imitation, like natural link, up to something totally broken, like the, the thing I was just talking about, like when the symbol becomes an autonomous category. So Hegel will break, he will symbolize in a certain sense the meaning of the symbol by dividing the notion between its two meaning, that is a first meaning which is imitation, natural, etc., which is the symbolic, and then a kind of a modern, contemporary uh, notion of the symbolic, which is this autonomous category that will make sense in the Romantic period. Okay? So when we read Hegel's aesthetics, in fact, what we read is the history of the term symbol. So let's start, if you want, by the imit imitation, imit imitative um, meaning of the symbol in the first period. Look at the... Um, We'll start with the two last quotes on, on the handout. Why does, he, um, why does he consider the Egyptian art as the uh, most accomplished definition of the class, let's say, usual definition of the symbol, like imitation Sarah? He says a symbol is like a pyramid. Okay, so he always reasons like that. Like every time he talks about the symbol, he symbolizes the symbol. So he shows that the pyramid in Egypt is the symbol of the symbol in the first sense. If we ask further, look at the last one quote, if we ask further for a symbolic art form to express this idea, we have to look for it in the chief structures built by the Egyptians. Here, we have before us a double architecture. One above ground, the other subterranean. Labyrinth under the soil, magnificent vast excavations, passages half a mile long, chambers, chambers adorned with hieroglyphics, everything worked out with the maximum of care. Then, above the ground, there are built, in addition, those amazing constructions amongst which the pyramids are to be counted the chief. Okay. So Hegel looks at Egyptian art as the symbol of something that is not Egyptian but Greek. Okay? Because we said that the first meaning of the symbol was Greek. It was defined by Aristotle. But Hegel is shuffling all that displacing the meaning of the symbol itself, to say, no, in fact, if we want to understand what the Greek meaning of the symbol was, we have to look at the Egyptian art. This is Hegel, you know, how to displace all the time everything. <laughs> Why that? Because um, e Egyptian art is made of, roughly speaking, two dimensions, um, overground and underground. And Hegel says, it is exactly what a symbol in rhetoric is. Underground is the signified, that is the, 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 the concepts hmm, that are labyrinthic, hidden, etc., those corridors. There are magnific magnificent passages in Hegel about the labyrinth. He says uh, that language is like a labyrinth with all these concepts, etc. And this external overground 
part, which is the pyramid itself, all the Sphinx, or you know these massive sculptures, that are supposed to express, to, to illuminate the underground meaning. Just like the scale illuminates the meaning of justice. Right? So it says, in fact, if we want to mm, understand what a rhetorical symbol is, what a figure of discourse is, we'll find it uh, in that kind of uh, artistic expression. Same thing, and it's very interesting with the, I'm sorry how to pronounce that, hier hier hieroglyph in French. How do you say that? The same, almost the same. Hieroglyph. Hieroglyph, okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, that is um, almost, what well, that was the, I don't know, I, I think it's very arguable, but still in, the, in Hegel's epoch, hieroglyphs were supposed to be natural expression yeah. of, of a concept because they look like designs, okay, like drawings. So he sees the same uh, relation between the pyramid and the hieroglyph, which is that they're supposed to express naturally something which is an uh, underground secret. So he also says, it is in Egyptian art that we find at, in its purest expression what a symbol is for the Greeks that is a natural expression of something hidden, like the secret, the secret made manifest, the secret expressed in the open air. And we, we, we find the same idea in the following quote. In this way, the pyramids put before our eyes, so it's important to, to find that before our eyes. In this way, the pyramids put before our eyes the simple prototype of symbolic art itself. So it's the symbol of symbols. It's a prototype of the symbol. They are prodigious crystals which conceal in themselves an inner meaning and as external shapes produced by art, they so envelope that meaning that it is obvious that they are for this inner meaning separated from, from pure nature and only in relation to that meaning. Okay? So the pyramid, in fact, repeats or I mean, expresses uh, the kind of uh, broken unity that we have in the symbolon it's broken between the overground and the underground. There's a natural link between both. It's a close totality, but at the same time, it refers to something transcendent, which is the meaning underground. And it's not arbitrary. So, of course, Hegel, uh, as you may know, he plays with these distinctions and these distinctions, and he shows that each period that he distinguishes, in fact, plays with the other period. So all art has an Egyptian um, uh, dimensions. Okay? It's not because he talks about Egypt that what he says about the symbol is limited to Egypt. We find this pyramid prejudice everywhere, even in contemporary art. Okay? What he describes here is a structure that he sees it in its purest form in Egypt. But again, it doesn't mean that this is only applicable to Egypt. We find the uh, crystal pyramid mode of significance in all forms of art. Okay, it's a structure. But in order to explain what this structure is, he, he thinks that the pyramid is the most explicit uh, figure. So, then he will move to classical art, which is Greek art. And he says that the difference between Egyptian art and Greek art is that when the pyramid is still very... Uh, Kind of set up in a certain sense, archaic in its form, not very refined. It's beautiful, but it's massive. It's, it shows that the Greeks 
try to try to give the external expression a beauty, confront to the external expression a beauty and a refinement equal to the meaning. Okay? The Greeks, according to Hegel, are trying to give a sophistic, well, as sophisticated an expression of the concept as the concept itself. Okay. So we still have the, the, the Egyptian basis that the symbol is here to express something else. But the difference is that we have an equal complexity, subtlety, between uh, the signified and the signifier. Well, we don't have this massive, Hegel says, form of the pyramid. We have, the, well, for Hegel, the, the, symbol, the most symbolic form of Greek art is the sculpture, the Greek sculpture. So we have you have beautiful pages where Hegel <coughs> compares the pyramid with, with the sculpture. But we have the same, we have the same economy in, in the two first periods, that is, the broken unity, uh, the reference to the absence of the thing, the expression of something in, internal, underground, the same, it's the same economy. But what is different is the, um, uh, the mode of expression and, and the refinement of the external form. But still, in, in the Greek period, as we said, the symbol is still understood as a rhetorical procedure uh, as a mode of expression, even if artistic, that is um, the um, use of the of a signified of the of a new signifier to designate well to express a signifier a signified sorry. So that so this this was the first economy of the symbolic that you find in Hegel's aesthetics. So what exactly is the deconstruction of the symbol that appears in the last period, which is romantic art. As the romantics themselves said, and this is what I explained a moment ago, in romanticism, and, and this was Hegel's time, the symbol ceases to be a pyramid. That is, there's nothing underground, okay? there's nothing behind, there's nothing external. As we said, the symbol becomes a totality in itself, closed on itself. And again, ceases to refer to an external reference. That's why Hegel says, I'm sorry, I'm going um, to the previous quotes but just before the, the two last one on the Egyptian art, you see he says, romantic art is the self-transcendence of art, but within its own sphere and in the form of art itself. So what is important is this notion of the self-transcendence. <laughs> Which means that, again, we have a, a totality, but this totality is infinitely open. So it's a transcendence in immanence. Okay, so the symbol is open, transcendent, because it, it has an infinity of meaning, but it's self-transcendent. Okay? Which means that, in fact, its openness, its exteriority is internal. Right? So there's no, the model of the pyramid is broken. It's obsolete. No? The work of art or the uh, uh, linguistic expression, like the figure of this course, ceases to be, again, uh, built on this model of the sculpture, the statue, or the pyramid. It is self-transcendent, like closed on itself. But, Ego says, then, if this is true, it means that the symbol disappears in its function, in both its rhetoric, rhetorical and artistic function. Because if the symbol is closed on itself and infinitely meaningful because of that, 
then we don't have any means to really distinguish between a symbol and a sign. Okay, you, do you understand? The, the symbol is losing its function. Because the, the, the essential function of a symbol is the pyramid. All symbols must be built as a pyramid. That is, an external expression of a secret. If you say that, in fact, the secret is everywhere, that nothing is underground, but that, in a certain sense, everything that is in the open is secret, then there are no symbols any longer. Okay? Yes? Um, so there is no displacement that is occurring in this. There is no displacement in the German romantic. romantic um, no. Yeah. Or, I mean, and this is the contradiction Hegel is addressing to his um, fellow philosophers. Mm -hmm. He says to them, and it, it is his critique of Goethe or the Romantics, like, you said that everything is open, so there's no displacement, but in your mode of analysis, you still refer to the pyramid. Like, for example, if you read, um, if you read most of the second, uh, how do you say that, comments on Mallarmé, most of them will try to explain to you what Mallarmé is saying. No? That they will, they will keep the old method of the pyramid. You see what I mean? And this is the bad comment. Okay? Like when Mallarmé talk about the swan, it means this and that. Okay? You see? So, and this prefigures what Derrida will say, that there's nothing outside the text. Okay? So, there must be a displacement, but what is it? You know, that's the problem. How, how, how can we remain faithful to the method of uh, the non-displacement? How can we interpret a text? How can you, we read a text without referring to the pyramid model? So for Hegel, there's no many ways. Just say, okay, uh, you know the, the motive of the end of art in Hegel? It says, art is over. The symbolic is over. <laughs> Poetry, uh, because if everything is in the open, and if the secret is everywhere, it means that there's no secret. Okay? So, it means that poetry, all forms of art, like sculpture, music, etc., etc., have lost their function. Hegel is asking a very interesting question, which is like, when we are done with the pyramid, when we, with the economy of the pyramid, then, we're done with art. Because as you said, there's no displacement anymore. So if that's the case, let's do philosophy. Says, now, yeah, the, 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 the future of art is philosophy. Art is coming to an end because now we, we only need concepts. I'm sorry, I had a problem with my hand up because I wanted to um, No, it is on the, on the hand up. I'm sorry, I, I had problems with that. But tomorrow it will be clearer. It's the, just the, the quote after the romantic art is a self-transcendence. Look at what he says just after. This self-transcendence, that is the moment when the displacement doesn't work anymore enters its final phase with poetry with which art itself begins at the same time to dissolve and acquires for philosophical knowing its point of transition to religious representation as well as to the prose of scientific thoughts. Okay, so this is the very important moment of Hegel's aesthetics where he announces that art start to dissolve itself, which means, of course, it doesn't mean that there are no works of art anymore, but it means that how do we deal with the end of the symbolic? How do we deal with the fact that, as you said, there's no displacement anymore, that the, the uh, relationship between the overground and the underground is deconstructed and that the secret is everywhere, that is nowhere, 
then we have to remain within language. Okay. Language is abandoned to itself. There's no, as Derrida will say, nothing outside the text. We are in language and there's no externality. But if that's the case, then poetry itself will dissolve into first the religious, and he refers here to this mystical tendency of romanticism, but most of all, philosophy, what he calls here the prose of scientific thought means philosophy. And this is an idea that you find in Arthur Danto's uh, book on the end of art, the end of art, where he says that after Hegel, all art becomes philosophical. That is self-explanatory. So this is a very touchy point, um, because for, for Hegel, of course, he has this uh, answer that, uh, in a certain sense, philosophy is the future of art, because in philosophy, we explain things, we, in a certain sense, use a certain type of displacement, that when I explain something, I can explain it in different ways. I repeat myself by using different modes of explanation. But at the same time, in this displacement, I, re I remain within the same realm. I'm not referring to anything else. And for Hegel, the definition of philosophy is that philosophy has no object. doesn't have a specific topic. doesn't have a specific mode of expression. Doesn't have a specific material. It doesn't have a specific language. It, it, it is a use of language within language. So philosophy appears as the end of the symbolic and as a mode of explanation that is adequate to uh, the end of the Egyptian model. But of course, this point has remained very controversial uh, because uh, contemporary philosophers like Derrida, for example, will say, no, 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 no. It, it can also open this moment when language remains imminent to itself. It can also open a new moment in poetry, art, etc. You know, Hegel has his, his answer, but there are others, of course, like Heidegger. And so. okay. But it has, I mean, this moment when the symbol loses its definition of broken unity between something external and something internal has had a dramatic influence on uh, Western uh, aesthetics, philosophy, etc. Because what do we do? What is understanding? What is reading? What is creating? What is when we don't have this uh, structure of overground, underground, this um, conception of uh, the secrecy of something uh, hidden and something manifest, you know? So when we're deprived of that, of that kind of uh, tools, what do we do? So Hegel has this answer. There are others, of course. But <coughs> yes? Sorry. I just want to make sure I understand. Yeah, OK. Basically, the end of the symbolic, but it is actually the end of the thought that there is something that is unmanifested, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then following that, we do not need a symbol anymore because we do not have to link between the underground and the overground. So, yes. basically, the kind of radical way of looking is basically to say everything is manifested. Right? Everything exactly. Is <coughs> exactly. But as we will see, uh, this is precisely um, what will determine <coughs> another form of secrecy in Lacan, which will become the unconscious. Okay? So we will see that, um, yes, there's this moment when um, there's this kind of emancipation from the secret, 
this is true. But we'll see that for psychoanalysis in particular, it is the beginning of another type of secrecy, mm -hmm. but of a different kind. As you know, for Lacan, the signified is so important. Right? You're a letter, mm -hmm. but it's not because you're a letter that you're legible. Okay? And Lacan says, okay, okay, Hegel, but, but you know, he was very much influenced by Hegel. All right, everything is linguistic. Everything, now we're in language. Mm -hmm. There's no secrecy anymore. But this is precisely because of that, that we're facing the major secrecy. Mm -hmm. That when everything is in the open, everything is cl not clear, but everything is uh, manifest and there's no underground. It's like... We cannot get out. It's like, you know, um, Bart talks about the prison of language, like the prison of the open. So, in fact, this deconstruction of the symbol goes on and on and on. But it's always, you're right, it, it, it's always linked with the displacement of the secrecy. Yeah. So, do you have other questions, by the way? Yes. Yes, just to follow up on that. Uh, you mentioned this distinction between the sign when the link is arbitrary and then the symbol where the link is necessary, also in previous yes. thought. So if the distinction between sign and symbol disappears or is, is mud muddled, uh, what happens then with this distinction between arbitrariness and necessity? Because I don't suppose that Hegel would say that then every link, every logical connections within language then becomes arbitrary. But, but is it another kind of necessity that arises then? Is it another concept of necessity? So yeah, it, it's very interesting. So his response, you're right, it doesn't mean that everything becomes arbitrary. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that everything becomes necessary either. So we have to play with contingency and necessity within language. So for him, the answer is that Philosophy has to, to provide a new kind of uh, totality, which is the system. You know, Hegel is writing a system, and what is a system? In fact, a system is a totality in which each point explains another one. Okay? I, instead of having it like in the symbolic uh, uh, era, instead of having um, the scale for justice, that is something which is external, you have within the same system a, a kind of self-explanation like each, for example, I'm referring to you, you are referring, you know, a kind of, uh, uh, like in mathematics, where all points are in <coughs> relations to each other, but within a close totality. And this is this re series of relations that transform arbitrariness into necessity. Now, it's, it's the reciprocal explanation of all points in a system. Okay. Yes? Uh, just a clarification. Uh, when Hegel said, uh, there's, no more step, there's no more symbol, he referred to uh, no more symbol in romantic thought, in romantic write, writing. Yes? If uh, a romantic thinker, like Schleiermacher, for example, uh, under modern romantics, he will deal with non romantic text. Uh, Schleiermacher will still insist that there's such thing as a hidden meaning. Yes. No, I mean, they say there's no hidden meaning. The romantics, their specificity, as, as Todorov explains very clearly, is that. Um, well, there, there might be an inner meaning, but this inner meaning is without external external meaning. I mean, that the complexity of something is without any reference to something external. Right? Like the example of Mallarmé. It is absolutely helpless to try to explain a Mallarmé's poem by referring it to external reality. Okay? So you have to find a way of explaining the thing within the thing. And this is romantic thinking. 
But what Hegel says, and this is what he accuses his uh, fellow philosophers uh, of doing, is that despite their definition of the symbol, they still use the Egyptian method. You understand what I mean? That it is impossible, according to Hegel, it is impossible to remain faithful to the romantic principle without getting out of romanticism. That is, without uh, affirming, okay, so let's, let's do philosophy. Let's say, okay, everything is conceptual. But then if you do that, you're not in romanticism anymore. Is, is it clear? Yes. Thank you. Uh, but uh, from a more cultural approach, yes. uh, this of course would be the, the term, which is the cultural studies term. Uh, it's when the critique of the symbolic would come up, right? So, uh, because um, if we think that the symbol does something like a self, a clause, and that it's obviously <coughs> doesn't have any openness to culture, it's problematic. So that's when we are going to start studying the critique of the symbolic, right? That's uh, just a comment. About. Um, well, yes, because what will happen, because I'm, I'm, uh, I have to tell you what will happen with <coughs> anthropology, etc., is that what remains of the symbolic in Hegel's analysis, what remains of it is the contract. Okay, so we lose the first meaning of something is referring to something else in its absence, but we keep the contract. We're all bound, this is the system, we're all bound together by language. And this is for Lévi-Strauss and for Lacan, the essential meaning of the symbolic, that we are all part of the speaking community. And this is an unbreakable bound. Okay? So we can say, okay, there's no pyramid anymore, there's no symbol in that sense, but what remains from the symbol is this broken piece that we all share. Because when, I, when I'm speaking to you at the moment, it is as if I was giving you this piece of clay, like, do you understand me? It means we, okay, we're part of the same alliance, right? For uh, Butler and these people, this is what is normative. Exactly. Yeah, because um, they say, but what, what contract are you talking about? What kind of contract? Uh, how do you think the, the bond? And this is what will appear as normative in Hegel. Is that we're, we, we are supposed, okay, we, we, we can renounce, the, we can uh, refute the pyramid economy, but we are supposed to speak the same language, even if coming from different languages, I mean, <coughs> we would have a kind of a community which is the speaking subject, all right? And so, it's true that Hegel thinks, he thinks that whoever you are, from whatever part of the world you're coming, you can understand, please say, that if, if the phenomenology of spirit is translated into Chinese. Huh? A, a Chinese speaker will understand what it is about. This kind of universality, which is that, yes, uh, no matter how different we are, we are linked, we, we are attached, all of us, by, by the same uh, contract. And this is precisely uh, what uh, uh, these people, the critique will. Yes. You're coming on to Lacan uh, on another day, but you know Lacan's topology of the extremity that Blanche and Foucault take up, this radical outside that's intimate. So there's, uh, it's imminent. Imminent, but, but, but open. It's, and it's, it's open, but it's radically exterior. So it's the thought from and of the outside but it's intimate to the subject, and it's how you suffer the contract. There is a symbolic, you're thrown into it, you're forced to exchange yourself with it, it mortifies you, you suffer specificity or singularity of it, and how you suffer that is that intimate 
exteriority that is not part of the contract but a consequence of the contract. So that's the real as a consequence of the contract, of the symbolic. And I just wonder whether that's the pyramid structure or not. No. Still. No. You think it's not? I think it's different. <coughs> I think this is precisely more of the romantic thing, a Hegelian thing, okay. which is that um, <coughs> the, the depth and the suffering and the is not reduced in the new model, but it's, it's <coughs> the open part of the closure, I don't know, it's the, as you said, it's the infinite opening of the closure. But how does dialectics work in relation to yeah. these questions? Uh, I think dialectic works at different levels, which is, first of all, that Hegel never said, okay, we used to be like that, now we're like that. Mm -hmm. Because the uh, Egyptian thing, as I said, is lasting. You know? So we're constantly struggling, all of us, with the two different kinds of principles. We all are pyramidic in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. And we all are um, conceptual. So dialectics works as a, this permanent contradiction between, at this level, between uh, the attempt at considering that there's a secret hidden. We will never be, be done with that. We'll forever, I think, deal with this idea that there's something secret. And at the same time, the emancipation from that. So dialectics is this tension between secrecy, between the resistance of secrecy and, and, and the emancipation from that. So this is how dialectics work. And it's true that in Hegel, there's an attempt in the end at saying that what he calls absolute knowing at the end of the phenomenology, that we might, we might think of a way of getting rid definitely of the of the secret. So this is the last page of, of, of the phenomenology, but the last word of the phenomenology phenomenology are yes, but when we reach that point, we start over. You know, the, the end of the phenomenology is the restarting. So yeah. But can I just say that the, the Lacanian idea is that there is a traumatic excess that can never be sublated into the dialectic. And that's why he develops this notion of sublimation, because it attaches to what can never be sublated. So even though the, the dialectic tries to swallow the world Absolutely. and digest yeah. it, there's something that sticks in the gullet of the dialectic that can never be swallowed. It's true that the resistance to Hegel in the 20th century was, uh, no, okay, we, we, we understand, all right, there's no secret, there's no pyramid, but still, your solution, which is the dialectical system, which is, is not the right one, uh, it's not because there's no secret anymore that we don't have excess, exactly what you said. And it's not because there's no secret anymore that we are not producing an excess of signification. Uh, so what are we doing with that? It, it cannot be entirely swallowed by philosophy, as Hegel was uh, assuming. So what do we do with that? Okay, yeah, so you're right. But um, at the same time, they will all share this idea by Hegel, according to which um, the inner, out, outer economy of meaning is obsolete. There was another question, I think. Yeah, was it you? I saw someone. Yeah, okay, well, we'll start with. <clears throat> I wonder, since you invoke the phenomenology of spirit, if you see any tension between the accounts we get from these lecture notes and the kind of, I would say, much more dialectical twist on this problematic that you get in phenomenology, and especially that, that bit about which I think you wrote in the plasticity book. Of, on Hegel about the girl with the muses, this moment when the very possibility of even thinking about world history in terms of this kind of art, this kind of art, type token, is itself, is dialectically grasped by Hegel 
as an expression of a certain romantic moment. To put this in simple terms, it's not quite clear if there was such a thing as art for the Egyptians, if there was such yeah, a thing as art for the Greeks. It, I think in a very simple-minded version of Hegel, maybe one could say this, but what appears as art to us was simply self-transcendence of the religion. For the Egyptians, it was the pyramid. For the Greeks, it was the body. And that's where romantic art is very different, because it's a self-transcendence of art towards, as he puts it here, religion or science. So we're dealing with two beneath this kind of smattering of what sounds to me like Hegel's pedagogy, this kind of art for Egypt, this kind of art for the Greeks, and now romantic art. I think there is another layer which is more in touch with the kind of deeper yeah. self-reflexive no, form of absolutely. Hegel, which is much yeah. more sort of radical and I think much more traumatic for us because it doesn't take for granted that there is such a thing as art. It does take on the romantic fixation on the universality of art and then it radically historicizes it and then criticizes the ideologies of the aesthetic that emerge from it. Okay, so yes, this is very, very interesting. But, so to, to go deeper into Hegel, the way in which he will answer that question of meaning is that, according to him, something that he calls the concept or spirit, which comprises every cultural expression, is explaining itself. Okay, so history, on the one hand, which is the temporal, the succession of epochs, is in fact the expression of something more logical, which is that, in fact, reality is nothing but the concept explaining itself. This is the difficulty of Hegel that uh, there's no difference between the real and the conceptual. That reality, what we see in reality, all the conflicts, the political problems, etc., etc., are expressions of something which is not phenomenological, but logical. It is thinking, explaining itself. Mm -hmm. And there's no difference between this and reality. But this has two layers. One is logic, this is the science of logic, and the other is historical. That's why in Hegel you have the two kinds of discourses. One is logical, very dry, very when he when he has this expression of rea reality and concept explaining themselves. Um, this is the very difficult Hegel, very abstract when you only have concept explaining itself. So there's no no phenomena phenomena at all, and you also have. Uh, the historical discourse, like his courses, like the aesthetics, where he puts everything into faces, into history. But you cannot separate the two. The phenomenology is the in-between. Okay? But for Hegel, there's no difference between what he says in the science of logic and what he says in his courses. Of course, the courses are, we just have the notes from the students, but it doesn't mean that for Hegel they are less important. That reality has two major expressions, which are history and concept, and both are absolutely inseparable. So yes, you're right, in a sense, uh, we cannot really periodize, like say, Egyptian, Greece, etc., because all this is the expression of this self-explanation of thinking with itself, okay? But at the same time, it appears in the world. This self-explanation appears in the world, and everything for Hegel that appears is historical. It is immediately taken into a historical uh, expression. But you wanted to ask something? Just Okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So you are correct that there are basically two main parts of this break. One is what we said is this unmanifested break of the underground, but also 
understanding a figure or a form as a unit which is isolated and autonomous and therefore we cannot understand it by relation yeah. to anything mm -hmm. else. So it's basically two radical and huge elements to this break, I would say, right? It's not only the underground, it's also this isolation, both. Yes, absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's the second break. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's the first, what I described as the first break, that is the passage from the rhetorical to the uh, aesthetic. Hmm? Yeah. Which is this uh, new meaning of the symbol as a totality or a totigory. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the actuality, what, what would that mean, for example, if I understand a person, it means that, for example, culture won't go into my understanding or other personal relationships or social categories, that mean that I'm trying to understand it in complete isolation? I mean, this is the third break, <coughs> which is yes, but at some point. The symbolic, <coughs> even if in its new version of the openness, is not able to give us keys to understand the others. Okay? That it's not because you said, oh, now everything is in the open, we can use concepts. It's not because of that, that we can understand each other. This is what Hegel thought, that once everything is translatable into concepts, it's the opening of the universal, you know, universal history, communication between people, etc. If everything is open, everything is open. So there's no, there are no real differences anymore. <coughs> everybody can, with translation, of course, everybody can access the same. <coughs> but this is once again the limit of the symbolic. That's no. So, some thinkers in the 20th century has demonstrated that it wasn't true. It wasn't true. Even psychoanalysis is not universal. So um, that the category of the symbolic, even when it means the open is, is not able anymore to, yeah, there are, I think this is this idea according to which there are closures which at the same time are, are not secrets. You, 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 can, you can speak of something incomprehensible without calling it a secret. Okay, so it's not only, oh, we're moving from the, uh, from the closed to the open, but it's like we're moving from the open to a form of closure, which at the same time is, is not hidden. You know, for example, a cultural um, singularity is not secret. It's just that it's not mine, and, and, and so in that sense I cannot really access it. So here, the category of the symbolic is, um, is challenged. Yes, a question in relation to the role of religion. If we have to think of religion in between uh, as a state in between mm -hmm. art and, and philosophy. philosophy, I suppose, I don't remember this very clearly, but I suppose we have to think of Christianity <coughs> and Jesus Christ as the moment where God, a transcendent God, becomes imminent or part of human history. And if that is correct, is, can Jesus then be seen as the last symbol or rather as the already disappearing of Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> no, no, you're right. You know, it has generated an immense literature, your question. Yes. Is, is Jesus a symbol? This is an immense problem, you know. So, yes, for many theologians, yes, Jesus is a symbol. And Hegel is unbearable. No, religion is not philosophy. And there's a dimension of religion that is definitely symbolic. Yes, with a hidden meaning. Yes. And that Jesus is the gate to that. Uh, profusion of uh, meanings of God and that biblical hermeneutics is still indebted to the pyramid principle. Otherwise there wouldn't be any religion anymore. Okay? If you, if you say everything is open, you don't believe in anything anymore. 
So there's a great defense of uh, Jesus as a symbol. The for Hegel, of course, Jesus is everything but a symbol. No, Jesus is part of a concept. Yeah. So you don't have to interpret Jesus. No. Jesus is the just a. It is the uh, incarnation of the concept, but it is not a symbol. Yes. Just to clarify. Um, the, when you talk about the closure and the openness, the closure and the openness exist together as if the, the, the category and um, the, it, both if the inter, interior and the exterior exist, isn't that what, what, the, what Hegel wants to say through his, through his critique of, the, uh, or of his uh, understanding of German Romanticism is the coexistence of that um, the openness and the closure and the tension that exists between the two. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the fact that there is no secret presupposes that there is already a secret some in some sense, right? I mean, otherwise, so is that is that all right to read it like that? Yes. I mean, I think this is what dialectics is about. Exactly. You know, negativity, etc. Where does the negative come, come from? I think it comes from this, where is the secret? There's one, there's not, there's not, you know? I mean, this is the, yeah, that would be very interesting to, I think, analyze what the secret in Hegel means. I would think that that's where the dialectics make itself more evident instead of looking else, because uh, I mean, yeah, that, that would be my entry point into understanding the dialectics. Mm -hmm. and, also, and also Hegel's text itself, mm -hmm. which is, as you know, extremely difficult, which is like a secret. You know, somebody who says, oh, there's no secret, but at the same time you can't read it. <laughs> it's very interesting. It's very interesting what he does with the writing. It's very interesting. Uh, I think that was, yeah, was another one. There's uh, an African saying that says, uh, I think, therefore I exist, is the killing of I dance, therefore I live. Is that the killing? Is the killing of I dance, therefore I exist. Uh, I was thinking about this, and could there be an emotional side of symbolism that is unaccess unaccessible just by linguistics? Emotional? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Emotional. That um, there is a, a symbolic way of representing uh, existence by uh, by emotions uh, that art can uh, can yeah. can bring somehow, and linguistics is itself cannot access. Uh, this could bring uh, cultural difference. Yes. That okay. Okay. I understand what you accessible right. by Hegel. Yes, of course. Yeah, but precisely for Hegel, and this is perhaps not the most interesting part of Hegel, uh, for him, these modes of expression are um, pre-conceptual. They are still naive, and you know. Yeah, because this is like a, a, a very essential part of modernity, right? That can uh, somehow bring uh, a colonized. Uh, way of interpreting symbolism. Yes, absolutely. I, I agree with you. Now, <coughs> we would also have to discuss if to know whether what Hegel represses is the emotional. I think this is also a co colonial vision mm. that not non-Western cultures would be more emotional. I think this is also some, something we would have to explore more. But you're, you're right that Hegel has this uh, vision, which is very ethnocentric, of the concept as the accomplished uh, mode of expression. More accomplished than emotion, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Katrine, can I suggest we... Uh, oh, it's, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course, yes. Um, Thank you.
tomorrow you bring the PDS from the distros. Um, okay. yeah. Sorry, my photocopies were. <laughs> Right. It's true. <laughs>